Oh, hell, Internet. This is an exploration of Fear and Trembling by Johannes de Silentio in 1836. I am not an academic, so take me with a pinch of salt. Silentio is one of the many pseudonyms of Soren Kierkegaard, who is sometimes called the father of existentialism because I feel his voice can be heard plaintively calling out for something to save the thread of Occidental tradition before the first true existentialists of the 20th century. This can be seen in the title of the book, the dramatic and evocative Fear and Trembling, which is an exploration and a commentary of the story of Abraham and the nature of the experience that was the binding of Isaac. There is far more to it than that, however. This is a look at what I consider the broad strokes of the book, and it's going to be quite long enough already. A few notes before we get started. First, Kierkegaard was only a proto-existentialist, which means he retains much of the religious heritage that came before him. He thought that there was a personal God with which one can personally interact. I lean more towards bona fide existentialism, and therefore I can summarize where I stand as a Gnostic, which means that there may or may not be a personal God, but it is ultimately and irrevocably hidden. However, the nature of ultimate truth for me is a bit like Zeno's paradox. We can indeed get closer to it almost indefinitely, just never quite enough to reach it. And the closest things that we can actually muster under a given set of rules will resemble a contradiction. This does lend itself, I feel, well to the Hegelian conception of the absolute, which Kierkegaard is addressing here. And it does leave the door open just a crack for traditional conceptions of God to slip in. The next note, leading on from that though, look, I'm not here to debunk the whole history of Abrahamic or any other religion. I do hope to tread carefully on the ground that I am walking here, but I do have my own perspective and I think I will not be respectful enough for some. Bear that in mind. But with that in mind, I want to summarize my perspective up front in the full awareness of my fallibility. I liken the relationship that humans have with the monotheistic God to be exactly what his adherents say it is. God is the Father. And eventually, all of our parents become less a part of our lives as we, humanity, get older. And then one day, at some point, whether or not that that means God actually exists is something that we are literally not able to know, as I understand it. So, some may try to cast me as a deist, whatever, but for me, whether or not the Tao is personal is itself a Gnostic question, which means it is beyond the veil of a Gnosticism, and so making any claim as to whether or not there is a deity seems to me to be irrelevant. Again, it seems to me at least that Kierkegaard is trying to present a way here for the greatness of God to come back into the world somehow. But it's not clear to me that his kind of radical faith is either A, the next step towards truth, or B, necessarily divine in any meaningful sense. Third point, although we know that this book was written by Soren Kierkegaard, indeed it was never really a secret, we're nonetheless to regard Johannes de Silentio as having his own author's voice, and that some things that are true of Silentio are not true of Kierkegaard. I am not a scholar of Kierkegaard myself, and so I may not represent this accurately through my perceptions of the text. Caution is advised. I suspect that when the writer refers to himself in either the first or the third person throughout the text, we should clearly think that this is De Silentio specifically. Also, Johannes de Silentio translates as John the Silent, who was actually a 6th century Christian figure who lived in solitude for much of his life, and nonetheless also held some leadership positions in the church around modern-day Turkey and Armenia, making him a bit of a paradox himself. Next point, Kierkegaard or Silentio, does make use of rather repetitious language to drive home his points. I have not emphasized all examples, but just know that it is constant throughout the work. This is something we do also see repeatedly in religious texts. Why is this the case? Well, let me take a leaf from Kierkegaard and relate it as an anecdote. Once upon a time, there was a man who was reading the teachings of the Buddha, and he cried out in vexation, It's just so repetitive, says the same thing over and over again. And his wife said to him, You're missing the point. It's not an explanation. 
If I take a slightly less charitable view on this, then it suggests that the repetitious nature of liturgical speech is reminiscent of the modern art of repeating a lie so often that the human mind begins to regard it as legitimate through pure exposure, or, as Arendt might have it, the modern art of self-deception. The truth, of course, is more subtle than that either way. On a related note, Salentio's prose is very poetic, and there are many little metaphors and flourishes, too many to consider in this piece, although I have kept some in, in spite of the length this adds. I hope that the viewer will consider these to be worthwhile, and it is an integral part of the experience of fear and trembling. However, it is in the nature of this kind of prose that people will fixate on different aspects in forming their relationship with it. I hope that I have chosen quotes that correctly represent Salentio's view, but it is likely that some will disagree, and I would like to hear about any other interpretations that viewers may have. Lastly, I warn you going in, Kierkegaard is working from Hegel here, and Hegel is famously abstract. Parts of this get so abstract that they sound like, perhaps even become, just meaningless tautologies. I remind you again, I'm not an academic, and I've not read Hegel in any depth. Take this as a good faith set of queries overall. But even if I'm not failing in my effort, then yes, some of this is going to sound crazy. But there is kind of a reason for that. There are eight sections to the book then, each of widely varying length. This first part will look at the first three. The preface, prelude, and panegyric introduce the field of the investigation and explain why this is the story that Silentio wishes to focus on. Then a preliminary expectoration gets into some of the mechanics that he will be using in his discussion. Then there are the three problemata, essays dealing with three moral questions inspired by the story of Abraham. Finally, there is a very brief epilogue, or perhaps a postscript? Come on, Silentio, you missed that one, didn't you? In the preface, Silentio rather sarcastically addresses what we might call the concrete philosophical problem here, which is, somewhat circularly, our inability to be satisfied with the answer to any concrete philosophical problems we may have. In our age, says Silentio, everyone with a passing interest in philosophy wants to doubt everything and then go further. Perhaps it would be untimely and ill-timed to ask them where they are going, but surely it is courteous and unobtrusive to regard it as certain that they have doubted everything, since otherwise it would be a queer thing for them to be going further. This preliminary movement they have therefore all of them made, and presumably with such ease that they do not find it necessary to let drop a word about the how. And yet, it seems, people also want to express faith and then go further. In our time, nobody is content to stop with faith, but wants to go further. It would perhaps be rash to ask where these people are going, but it is surely a sign of breeding and culture for me to assume that everybody has faith, for otherwise it would be queer for them to be going further. In talking about these desires to go both beyond faith and beyond doubt, Silentio is clearly poking fun at this idea of going further than something that is already too nebulous to clearly define. Do these people know that they have doubted everything? Do they know they really understand what faith is? But De Silentio doesn't know either. Rather, he thinks that faith is a project for a lifetime and not something that can be acquired and then moved past. It is here, right at the beginning of the book, that Silentio references the title, speaking of something that affects us throughout life. When the tried oldster drew near to his last hour, having fought the good fight and kept the faith, his heart was still young enough not to have forgotten that fear and trembling which chastened the youth, which the man indeed held in check, but which no man quite outgrows, except as he might succeed at the earliest opportunity in going further. And, as best I can judge anyway, this thing that enables us to believe that we have gone further is the system. Silentio claims that he is no agent of the system and that he does not know how it works, but he remarks on how effectively everyone else seems to operate within the system and how he stands in awe as he is quite bereft. 
What is this system? It is not made clear, but it seems to be, very abstractly, the artifice of the world, especially that part of it that supports people's ability to think of themselves as going further than some boundary without ever having clearly delineated it. Oh, and science is definitely part of the system. But Silencio has a sense that his words will not be heeded in their intended form. He expects to be ignored, or he trembles at the still more dreadful thought that one or another enterprising scribe, a gulper of paragraphs who to rescue learning is always willing to slice the author so that there were 50 words for a period and 35 for a semicolon. Do we have a problem? Alright, so I guess Silencio has me dead to rights here, although I do not count words when composing my sentences. But what is he saying then? What is wrong with me trying to distill something out of the barrage of metaphors that is fear and trembling? Can Silencio really claim that his work cannot be distilled or condensed in any way? I see his suggestion that this should be an experience of passion and not a mere explanation. But it seems like a rather grandiose claim, the kind of claim that is often made about scripture, you might say. Silentio does also make a point of reminding us that Descartes himself considered that God was supreme and that his, Descartes, reflections on doubt were explicitly personal. Still, Silentio's dismay at how others may distill his work does seem very convenient for him. But he is not here to defend himself, so comment on his behalf. In the prelude, Silentio introduces the primary focus of the book, the story of Abraham and the binding of Isaac, and he gives us a self-insert character, a man who was enraptured by this story as a child, but he understands it less and less as he gets older. But he yearns more than anything to understand Abraham, and he knows that he can only do this by witnessing the process itself. The project of fear and trembling, then, is to explore as deeply as possible the mindset of Abraham through the crucible of the drawing of the knife. To set us up, we are given four reflections on how the story might have gone differently, all bound together by a common metaphor of a child being weaned from the mother's breast. In the first reflection, upon reaching Mount Moria, Abraham resolves to tell Isaac what is happening. Isaac is dismayed and pleads for his life. Abraham tries to be fatherly and encouraging as they proceed up the mountain, but Isaac just doesn't understand. Then, somewhere up the mountain, Abraham turns upon Isaac and his face is changed wild. He seizes Isaac and calls him a fool. This is not God's instruction, this is Abraham's desire. And terrified, Isaac cries out to God to protect him. And Abraham secretly says, Lord, I thank thee, for it is better for him to think I am a monster than to lose his faith in thee. When the child must be weaned, the mother blackens her breast. It would indeed be a shame that the breast should look delicious when the child must not have it. So the child believes that the breast has changed, but the mother is the same. Her glance is as loving and tender as ever. Happy, the person who had no need of more dreadful expedients for weaning the child. In the second reflection, Abraham travels to Moria, prepares the pyre, binds Isaac, draws the knife, but then, apparently, falters at the last and sacrifices the ram instead and returns home. From that time on, Abraham became old. He could not forget that God had required this of him. Isaac throve as before, but Abraham's eyes were darkened and he knew joy no more. When the child has grown big and must be weaned, the mother virginally hides her breast, so the child has no more a mother. Happy the child, which did not in another way lose its mother. In the third reflection, the story I think played out exactly as it did in the Bible, and the suggested result is that Abraham is haunted by the idea that he had drawn the knife, and forgotten a father's duty to his son. He rides out to Moria again to beg for forgiveness, 
but he could not comprehend that it was a sin to be willing to offer to God the best thing he possessed, that for which he would have many times given his life. And if it was a sin, if he had not loved Isaac as he did, then he could not understand that it might be forgiven, for what sin could be more dreadful? When the child must be weaned, the mother too is not without sorrow at the thought that she and the child are separated more and more, that the child which first lay under her heart and later reposed upon her breast will be so near to her no more. So they mourn together for the brief period of mourning. Happy the person who has kept the child as near and needed not to sorrow any more. The fourth reflection is almost like the third. Abraham remains resolute. But when he turned and drew the knife, Isaac saw that his left hand was clenched in despair, that a tremor passed through his body. But Abraham drew the knife. They return home, presumably after biblical events play out as before, but this time it is shown to be Isaac who has lost his faith. We can speculate that this is the reverse of reflection one. Isaac saw the despair in his father's actions and realized in that moment that God could demand terrible things to be done in his name. When the child must be weaned, the mother has stronger food in readiness, lest the child should perish. Happy the person who has stronger food in readiness. From here we return to the hypothetical man who is our framing device for these reflections. Thus, and in many like ways, that man of whom we are speaking thought concerning this event. Every time he returned home after wandering to Mount Moria, he sank down with weariness. He folded his hands and said, No one is so great as Abraham, who is capable of understanding him. What are we to make of the prelude then, and in particular these codas on the weaning of the child? Each of them seems to mirror its respective story somehow. I will express some of my thoughts, but this shows the dangers of interpreting metaphorical language, because there are at least two metaphorical threads we can wrangle out of these juxtapositions of myth and biology. We can suggest that Abraham is the mother in the metaphor, or we can suggest that God is the mother in the metaphor. And I don't want to place too much emphasis on this either. These are sketches and no more valid than that. If Abraham reflects as the mother, then in the first story he changes himself to enable Isaac to keep his faith. In the second story, his failure takes away something that was vital in him. Somehow then he is no longer the same thing to Isaac. In the third story, he has sorrow for the memory of that traumatic time. And then in the last story, the mother has stronger food in readiness. In what way did Abraham betraying his anguish at the pivotal moment count as having stronger food in readiness? Clearly Abraham has signaled something to Isaac in that moment, the moment of drawing the knife. If God reflects as the mother, then in the first story it is God who changes Abraham. Although, just to be clear, this is done via Abraham's righteous action and we have that via Abraham's own opinion, historically. So, in the second story, God takes away something that Isaac previously saw in Abraham. In the third story, God extends a measure of sympathy, regret to Abraham for what was lost. And then in the fourth story, God signals stronger food to Isaac through Abraham in that moment of drawing the knife. And depending on how you read those interpretations, it's ambiguous as to who is the child and who is the breast in either case. Like I say, these metaphors demonstrate the ambiguity of what is being said here in the prelude, and I do not claim that my interpretation is the correct one, just to be clear. But based on what I've said above, I have some questions. In the first case, what happens? It's dramatic, compelling even, but we never get to the top of the mountain. We never see the pivotal moment. In the second case, what happens? Abraham draws the knife and then offers the ram and goes home. It's literally put that bluntly. The implication is that something was different, like he failed somehow, but what was actually different to the biblical version here? In the third case, what happens? 
we do see Abraham draw the knife, and then we time jump to some time later as Abraham ponders for answers. Again, it's really dramatic, I grant you, but like story number one, it's an incomplete rendering of the tale. And then in the last case, what happened? What is this stronger food, and what is actually different from the other cases? This time I will speculate that it is the witness that is different. Isaac saw Abraham's clenched fist at the moment of truth. This is why it was a signal. Something was transmitted, even though it was never spoken of afterwards. We could easily assume that Abraham's hand was clenched in the same way in every other case in which he draws the knife. Why not? If Silentio is going to be so cavalier with narrative details, why shouldn't we? And this kind of underscores the problem that seems to be emerging for me. And it's similar to the problem I have with all scripture. It is endlessly ambiguous, and it's been used in diametrically opposed ideologies through time. And I must be clear, that doesn't make scripture worthless, and it doesn't make it bad, but it does make it subject to legitimate doubt. Does Silentio really have a specific point and a purpose behind each of the reflections in this prelude? I don't know, and there is considerable scope for disagreement, which is great! In case you're wondering, a panegyric is a speech in praise of something or someone. I had to look it up too. But this is a little more multi-layered. Silentio begins with a powerful expression of what is at stake. If there were no eternal consciousness in a man, if at the foundation of all there lay only a wildly seething power which, writhing with obscure passions, produced everything that is great and everything that is insignificant, if a bottomless void, never satiated, lay hidden beneath all, what then would life be but despair? This says all that it needs to, but let's indulge Silentio a little as he continues. If such were the case, if there were no sacred bond which united mankind, if one generation arose after another like the leafage in the forest, if the one generation replaced the other like the song of birds in the forest, if the human race passed through the world as the ship goes through the sea like the wind through the desert, a thoughtless and fruitless activity, if an eternal oblivion were always lurking hungrily for its prey, and there was no power strong enough to wrest it from its more, how empty then and comfortless life would be. This is obviously a wonderful piece of prose, powerful and moving, but it doesn't really prove his case. It merely states a preference and encourages the reader to agree with that preference. What is the eternal consciousness? Is that the same thing as a sacred bond? How are these expressed? The answer to these questions would be necessary for the purpose of answering a follow-up question. Why would the existence of such things provide a more comforting lived experience for the members of humanity? All of this matters because Silentio seems to take this preamble to be sufficient, continuing, but therefore it is not thus. In other words, because of what I've just said, it's not the case there is no eternal consciousness. Citation needed? Colour me unconvinced here, but as we go on to explore Silentio's position, he might try to reply that that's more of a me problem. Let us continue. To express this consciousness, God created a sacred pairing, similar to that of man and woman, and that is of the hero and the poet, i.e. the actor and the storyteller. The hero goes out and does great deeds, and the poet, who loves the hero, will report on them and try to encourage all to see the hero how they, the poet, see them. This is the poet's task, and they are not just a hanger-on to the hero either, for the poet is, as it were, the hero's better nature. Powerless it may be as a memory is, but also transfigured as a memory is. And this draws a direct parallel with what we've been talking about in Arentian thought. It is those who tell the tales, who contextualize the actions of the hero, and through them the story comes to be. It would thus be entirely correct to say that the great deeds of the hero would not be great at all unless there was a poet to relate them and an audience to relate them to. And thus, perhaps it is not so powerless after all. 
The duality of the hero and the poet establishes a mechanism for greatness to propagate in the world. And this idea of greatness is introduced without definition, but we can imply that it is some manifestation of the eternal consciousness mentioned above. Greatness is how the idea of humanity beyond the animal comes to be. There follows a description of great individuals that is very repetitive and liturgical again. Silentio alludes to greatness in many different forms and degrees, and he always concludes that he who attempted the impossible is greater than all. He concludes by getting at last to Abraham himself. There was one who was great by reason of his power, and one who was great by reason of his wisdom, and one who was great by reason of his hope, and one who was great by reason of his love. But Abraham was greater than all, great by reason of his power, whose strength is impotence, great by reason of his wisdom, whose secret is foolishness, great by reason of his hope, whose form is madness, great by reason of the love which is hatred of oneself. Abraham is great precisely because his greatness is contradictory, and it is contradictory because his greatness is born out of an encounter with the absurd. Abraham was said to be God's elect, he who would bless all the nations of the world, and yet for many years he wandered in the world and did not see how this blessing would come to pass, and he did not understand how his barren wife could bear him a son, which led to a whole bunch of soap opera shit. To be fair, Silentio does not make much out of this, but the Bible seems to revel in it sometimes. Yet Abraham did not waver in his belief. We are presented with a number of alternatives similar to the prelude where subtly different things play out, and we are shown how many of them would still see Abraham remembered for his deeds, but that these would each be different from the true situation. This reality is the one in which Abraham draws the knife with intent to kill Isaac. I think we can sum up the following few pages with two short excerpts, one of which is 42 words and the other of which is 90. If Abraham had wavered, if he had said to God, perhaps it is not after all thy will, he would not have been forgotten, he would have saved many by his example, yet he would not be the father of faith. If Abraham, when he stood upon Mount Moriah, had doubted, if God had permitted him to offer the ram instead of Isaac, God did, didn't he? Then everything would have been the same, and yet how changed, for his retreat would have been a flight, his salvation an accident, his reward dishonor, his future perhaps perdition. Then Abraham would not have been forgotten, nor would Mount Moriah. This mountain would then be mentioned, not like Ararat where the ark landed, but would be spoken of as a consternation, because it was here that Abraham doubted. And perhaps in these alternative scenarios, the greatness of Abraham is supposedly diminished because he never took his faith to that point of confronting the contradiction of actually drawing the knife. Once again, harking back to the preface, faith and doubt are presented as opposites, but it is only because of the possibility of doubt that there can be any greatness in faith. In spite of the grandeur of this assertion and its implicit power, we should be wary of monotheistic exceptionalism. After all, the existence of faith then means that there can also be greatness in doubt. Silentio concludes the panegyric with the panegyric itself. Everything up to now has been a discussion of greatness and why Abraham deserves praise as being great, which does count, I guess, but now Silentio addresses Abraham directly in three paragraphs, the third of these being, Venerable Father Abraham, second father of the human race, thou who first wast sensible of, and didst first bear witness to that prodigious passion which disdains the dreadful conflict with the rage of the elements and with the powers of creation in order to strive with God. Thou who first didst know that highest passion, the holy, pure and humble expression of the divine madness which the pagans admired. 
to disdain the dreadful conflict in order to strive with God is, I guess, to hold firm to a course that points toward a contradiction because one believes somehow that there is still a truth to be discovered there. This is a divine madness because it will necessarily mean ignoring or overruling many of the everyday concerns that come in the normal course of life. This seems to prefigure Nietzsche's raising of the flag of Dionysus some decades later. It is also interesting that Salentio speaks of the pagans and kind of implies that their passion was just as true of that of Abraham. Finally, Salentio becomes self-deprecating. Forgive him who would speak in praise of thee if he does not do it fittingly. He spoke humbly and briefly, but he will never forget that thou hadst need of a hundred years to obtain a son of old age against expectation, that thou didst have to draw the knife before retaining Isaac. He will never forget that in a hundred and thirty years thou didst not get further than to faith. Okay, I have no notes. This creates a beautiful, passionate expression of what makes faith the greatest thing that might be aimed at, because by definition, to have faith is to court the absurd by one's belief, which is where greatness is born. But the idea that Abraham is great, the details on which we depend, is just a narrative based on incomplete details by many poets and imperfect curation. Now, I just want to briefly say, I know that the claim is that God has maintained the curation of scripture. <clears throat> I'm sorry, but I know a little bit about what went on about the time of the Nicene Creed being formed and color me unconvinced on that too, okay? In spite of all that, at the end of the first three sections of Fear and Trembling, I am genuinely swept up in the flow of Kierkegaard, I mean Silentio's writing, and it is awesome to see the process of using poetry and metaphor to approach the boundaries of what language is able to express. And you can take it from me, we ain't seen nothing yet. Bye for now.